Intel's 13th gen Raptor Lake has launched and Kit Guru's review of the new Core i9-13900K has gone live. Seems to be very popular with you, our readers. And yes, Canary Chrome, I hear you. Let's dig in to the new Core i5 and see just how well it performs and whether it's decent value for money. Intel claims, to use their own words, huge generational games across the stack. The stack in this case being i5, i7 and i9 K SKUs, and also the KFs without integrated graphics. In the case of the i9-13900K, as we've established, these claims pretty much hold water. And it is the Core i9 that has the biggest changes, so plus 8 E cores and 600 megahertz increase on turbo speeds. Some of the cores will run up to 5.8 gigahertz, all the P cores will run at 5.5 gigahertz. As you step down through the stack, the changes are less dramatic. So the i7 gains 4 E cores and 400 megahertz on turbo, this i5 13600K gains 4 E cores and 200 megahertz on turbo. When we compare the previous Core i5 12600K and the new Core i5 13600K, the first thing we see is that they sell at the same price when you buy a tray of 1000. In practice, this is not correct. We see the new 13600K selling at a significant premium. When we compare core count, those extra four E cores mean we now have 14 cores in total and 20 threads against 10 cores and 16 threads. And we can see on the spec sheet that the new P cores run 200 megahertz faster than the previous 12th gen, while the E cores run 300 megahertz faster. The technology in the E cores has not changed at all from 12th to 13th gen. So this either comes down to the better fabrication process or more power. To test the Core i5-13600K, we're using this Asus ROG Maximus Z790 Hero motherboard. Yes, it's completely over the top for the Core i5, but it's the same board I used for the Core i9, and probably will use for the Core i7 when I get my hands on one. So, consistency. Power supply, Seasonic Prime TX1600. Also completely over the top. Also consistency. SSD is a Sabrent Rocket 4.0 M.2 NVMe. Memory is G-Skill Trident Z RGB DDR5 rated at 6000 mega transfers. Thermal compound is Arctic MX4. The CPU cooler is a 360mm Corsair H150i Elite LCD. Graphics card is a Gigabyte Radeon RX 6950XT Gaming OC 16GB with three power connectors. In the BIOS setup screen, we can see the version number. It's worth reminding you that in my Core i9 review, I got a beta BIOS from ASUS because I wanted to be able to install a 12th gen processor in this motherboard. This BIOS has not yet been listed on the ASUS website. It is a BIOS that is not freely available. XMP is enabled to run the memory at 6,000 mega transfers. The power settings for the processor are on auto. And the fan curves have been set so the fans kick in as soon as the processor starts to get up to temperature. A quick run of Blender shows the P cores running at 5.1 GHz, the E cores at 3.9 GHz, and the power draw is slightly over 150 watts. Give it time, it goes up to 157 watts. And let's try an experiment, capping the power in the BIOS to 115 watts, and when we run Blender again, we see the clock speeds have barely dropped, and yet the power draw is indeed 115 watts, which is significantly lower than 155 or 157. Of course, we're more interested in overclocking the Core i5 than undervolting or capping the power. So in the BIOS, we reset the power limits to auto, and then in Windows, we open Intel's Extreme Tuning Utility, and with a simple click of Speed Optimizer, bingo, the overclocking job is done. And now in Blender we see that all the P cores are running at 5.3 GHz and the E cores at 4.3 GHz. Power draw 165 to 168 watts. Wasn't that easy and effective? 
Performance and testing charts. Now clearly we're interested in how the new i5 13600K compares to the previous i5 12600K, but we have some extra information. Luke is currently working on his Ryzen 5 7600X review, and I have some initial data from him. In Cinebench R23 multi-core, with the CPU pulling 157 watts and running at 5.1 gigahertz, it stomps the mid-range processors and it beats the previous Core i5 by a huge margin and makes the new Ryzen 5 look positively silly. Overclock it to 5.3 GHz and it picks up a healthy chunk of extra performance. Here we see the power consumption figures and the resulting temperature figures. The new i5 runs beautifully cool and draws a very reasonable amount of power. Cinebench R23 single core. Surprisingly, capping the overall CPU power does affect single core performance, even though the processor is only drawing 30 or possibly 40 watts in single core mode. With the power capped, it does well. On auto, it does even better. Overclock the processor and holy heck, it's stomping along. Blender Classroom. The margin of performance of the new Core i5 over the previous Core i5 is practically embarrassing. The thing is, the new Core i5 also beats the 12th gen Core i7. This processor is truly impressive. Handbrake Conversion H.264. I mean, look at this. Those Core i5 13600K figures are bracketing the Ryzen 9 5950X. Obviously, that's the Zen 3 model. We did not expect to see this sort of performance from Core i5. Handbrake Conversion H.265. Again, we see the new Core i5 beating the previous Core i7. And look, when you overclock the Core i5, it can even beat the Ryzen 7 7700X. This is quite remarkable. 7-zip benchmark. The figures for Core i5 13600K clustered very close together, but beating Core i7 and the last generation Ryzen 7. The new Ryzen 5 isn't even playing the same sport. 3 d Mark CPU profile. 3 d Mark scores are a bit of a peculiar thing. However, we can see the new Core i5 sitting comfortably in the middle of the chart. And then we get on to gaming at 1080p. Borderlands 3, we have a funny result. So with the CPU on auto, we see 145 FPS, cap the power, and the performance rises to 148 FPS. Do not know what that's about. Overclock the CPU, 149 FPS. We are directly competing here with the previous gen Ryzen 7 and Core i7. The new Ryzen 5 is comfortably behind. Far Cry 6 at 1080p. The new Core i5 sits far higher in the chart than we would have predicted. Hitman 3 at 1080. Again we see the new Core i5 doing much better than we would have anticipated. Shadow of the Tomb Raider at 1080p. With the new Core i5, the spread of frame rates is quite tight between 236 and 243. But just look, in the middle of those figures we see the Core i9 12900K. This Core i5 is something to behold. Watch Dogs Legion at 1080p. This is the test where the new Core i5 does worst. However, it's still doing pretty blooming well. As we reach my closing thoughts on the Core i5-13600K, I wonder, how many cores do you think you require in your gaming processor? Clearly quad-core is in the past. We're now onto six or more cores. I've seen comments below some of our reviews and news pieces on Intel's Alder Lake and our Raptor Lake processors referring to the e-cores as trash and that simply is not the case. The performance cores do the heavy lifting, the e-cores are clearly doing something. Rather than thinking about the Core i5 as a 6 core plus some other stuff processor, you're far better off thinking of it as a 20 thread processor. It makes much more sense. This processor trounces the new Ryzen 5. It takes battle to the previous gen Intel Core i7 and Core i9 in certain tests. And it also makes the new Ryzen 7 Zen 4 processor look a little bit silly. Yes, I know AMD will produce 3D models of some of their processors. We don't know which models yet. I wouldn't be shocked if they bring out another Ryzen 7 to uh, fill the gap between the current Ryzen 7 and the Ryzen 9 12 core. AMD has many options, that is undeniable, but this Core i5 is something to behold, and I think those test charts prove that point. So, my pros and cons. Pros, stunning performance. 
Also, simple overclocking with Intel Extreme Tuning Utility. Literally one click. Clearly you can dive in there and do it manually, but that one click overclocking is just easy. And also you can use Core i5 and Core i7 and Core i9 with a budget DDR4 motherboard should you feel the urge to save money both on the memory and the motherboard. If you already have DDR4 memory, there's a strong incentive to go down that route. I want to retest this processor on DDR4 to see what difference it makes. Clearly it's going to hurt it to a certain extent. But total platform cost is a big deal at the moment. Cons. Here in the UK, the new Core i5 is expensive. We were hoping it'd be 350 or less, but it's not. Compared to the Ryzen 5, the cost of the processor, park for the moment the total platform cost, the cost of the processor is higher. However, if you compare the Core i5 to the new Ryzen 7, you get a different impression of the market. Overclocking doesn't add as much extra performance as we hoped. That might sound contradictory as I praise the easy overclocking. The fact is you gain performance, it takes more power, runs slightly hotter, but actually the returns are fairly marginal. Running the Core i5 on auto out of the box yields very decent returns. And finally, the power draw looks more like Core i7 than Core i5. It's a serious processor. Unfortunately, Intel processors take more power than AMD processors. Let us hope that changes next gen, but right here, right now, this Core i5 is a serious piece of kit that does unfortunately require more power than we would like. Overall, I'm giving it a 9 out of 10 and a must-have.